At the end of the day, politics is really about two things, making decisions and then communicating those decisions effectively to the public. To be sure, the new Ontario government led by Premier Doug Ford has made plenty of decisions and at lightning speed. But how well have they communicated those decisions to gain the public's buy-in? Let's find out from two communications pros. Bob Picard is a principal at Signal Leadership Communications and Linda Andros is managing partner at Apex Public Relations and we are delighted to have both of you here at TVO tonight for this conversation about uh, how well the Ford government is doing and let's sort of, just for argument's sake, separate them into two separate baskets. There are the announcements that they plan to make and that they expend a lot of energy making sure that they announce well. And then there's the other basket of stuff which we just might call stuff happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just happens, it comes flying at them and you gotta fly by the seat of your pants to figure out how to respond. To that end, let's start with what was perhaps, well, I was gonna say the most controversial, but surely one of the most controversial decisions the government made. It was last summer. It was about cutting Toronto City Council down to size. Sheldon, the clip please. Now more than ever, the City of Toronto needs to get some big things done. So we're going to streamline Toronto City Council. We're going to align Toronto with federal and provincial boundaries. Instead of 47 councillors, there'll be 25 councillors. Now, what was interesting about this announcement, of course, is that this was nothing that they campaigned on, and it was sort of sprung on an unsuspecting public. Bob, how well did they communicate the message? I think they got their points across, but I don't think many people really believe that this was truly about efficiencies in government spending. I mean, that was the cover story, wasn't it? It was all about saving money. But for those of us who live in the city of Toronto, although I grew up in Ottawa, we realized that there's a score to settle here, and that played out in how they went about it with a bludgeon. And they pushed this through. They appeared to be uh, very single-minded about their determination to uh, do this in the middle of an election campaign. So you have to look at different measures of PR effectiveness. How do you know if your PR is going well? Do you look at the quantity of coverage? Well, they got tons of coverage. They there's sure no did. doubt about it. But then you have to look at the quality of coverage. Was that, was that coverage in the media, was it negative or was it positive? And I would say it was overwhelmingly negative. And you also have to look at who was really controlling the agenda here, um, the government's narrative or the voice of critics. And I would say that this was an interesting case study for the Ford government because it showed the centrality of Doug Ford with all of his strengths and weaknesses as a spokesperson out front and center. It also showed the chaotic nature of the government. There are always unexpected things happening, like this court decision, for example, or the, the judge's ruling, rather, mm -hmm. uh, when, when he threw a curveball into this and things took an unexpected direction and they were left scrambling. You're referring to the fact that the first judge who looked at this said, you can't do this. You can't do this, that's yeah. right. And that, this clearly a, a, appeared to be a real politic, brute mm -hmm. force sort of political agenda item where they weren't going to take no for an answer. Okay, Linda, how did you look at it? I, I thought it was... I thought this was his test. He was just gonna go and just lob that in there and see what happens. I think he always thought that he was gonna do this. Whether he you know, campaigned on it or not, I think it was already in his mind. And he was like, you know what? I'm gonna go down with something really, really that's gonna shake people up and see what happens. And he was firm. In his mind, he had made that decision that he was going to start off with this and sort of see where he was gonna get pushed back, how far could he go, what would happen. And I think that's where we're, you know, that worked. He got his way. So I feel like that's just reinforced what he's been doing. Uh, I think Bob's right when he says that the majority of the coverage that emerged from that announcement was negative, and certainly Absolutely. those who opposed it um, were given ample airtime to make that case. But here we are, October, November, December, January, February, we're less than four months since the election, Nobody talks about this anymore. No. Is that to suggest that at the end of the day, this was a PR win for the government? I, I would say so. I think it also set up what we didn't know at the time was going to be their strategy. I, I, you know, it's almost, I would call it fire hose communication, right? <laughs> Every day you get more and more, you're seeing tons of information coming. It's, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but it's, it's not even necessarily always 
well thought out, or if it is, we are not seeing that communicated to us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we started with this. Yeah, we're not even remembering what was communicated last week. We're, we're a little bit punch drunk on this. And, and I think that that, you know, he has a very specific mandate that he feels he needs to deliver. And I think from that regards, he's been successful. He is pushing forward his mandate at all costs, no matter if the media coverage is good or bad, he's gonna keep moving that forward and it has worked for him. Can, I, can we follow up on that fire hose notion? Is that, a, mm. is that a communication strategy insofar as we are just gonna keep bombarding you with announcements more and more day after day after day and pretty soon you're gonna be so punch drunk yeah. from the announcements um, we're gonna get away with some stuff. There's a very limited public attention span. It's like people have the ability to pay attention to a very intense crisis one day and then move on and forget about it the next day. Hmm. And I think they take advantage of this. Uh, they realize that if there's a controversy or something explodes unexpectedly, that they can then reprogram and introduce other PR stimuli in the public domain the following week or the following month. I think with, with the Ford government overall, though, you have to look at, are we talking about in the public domain uh, what they want us to talk about? Are they following some kind of well-thought-out PR strategy? Or is this highly improvised? What do you think? Uh, I think it's uh, highly improvised. And I think it shares a lot in common with the uh, nature of communications we see the Trump administration using down south right now. Um, there's, there's a chaotic nature about it. And almost every day there's a controversy or something, get, there's something gets leaked hmm. or, or uh, things don't play out as we are expecting they will. And I think just going back to your earlier comment about the, the Toronto Council decision, I mean, if you look at what is public relations, it's about telling your story to all the people who need to hear it so that folks will do and think what you want them to do or think. Hmm. You know, reduce the size of Toronto Council. Okay, there's a check mark there. But in terms of some of these other issues that we're talking about today, uh, I don't think that you can say that that's exactly what's happening. Well, let's pick up yeah. on that because, um, you know, the Toronto Council wasn't something they campaigned on, but they did it. Here's something that they did campaign on and then they broke the promise. Let's go. Please, Sheldon. While we're working on our new plan on compassionate grounds, we're going to raise rates by 1.5% across the board to help those with the cost of living. This will replace the patchwork of handouts and regulatory changes that were included in the Liberals' final days. We are also going to wind down the Ontario Basic Income Research Project, which is clearly not the answer for Ontario families. And we're going to continue to deliver on the promises we made to the people of Ontario, lowering hydro rates, scrapping the carbon tax, and cutting gas prices by 10 cents a litre. Okay, that's uh, Lisa McLeod, the Community and Social Services Minister. And Linda, that was a promise that they made during the election campaign that they would let that basic income pilot finish its course, and they changed their mind. That was the announcement in which they said, we're changing our minds. How well did they, how effectively did they communicate that message? I mean, I think that they effectively communicated the message. I, I would say that what they perhaps didn't do as effectively is actually do some consultation with some of the people that were gonna be impacted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's easy to communicate a message. Um, what's not so easy is to figure out all the factors and what the reaction's gonna be from all your different stakeholders and shareholders. And I don't think that's what they anticipated. And I actually don't even think that they anticipated how long people would actually dig into that. I mean, if you go on, you know, and at Twitter, there's now, you know, videos and people who have started campaigns and, and groups around this to bring this back. And I, I think that they thought, oh, people will be happy, you know, we're shutting this down or changing this, what this looks like. So yeah, it was a, a win for a couple hours. And then immediately some of the backlash came. In fact, Bob, the, uh, mm. the notion that we're winding down the basic income pilot yeah. was sort of hidden amid, yes. amidst some other announcements at the same time. Sure. Um, you know, that's pretty clearly a, an, a strategy for trying to deliver bad news. One of the oldest tricks of the PR book, sure. Mm -hmm. How well did they do it? I don't think they did it very well. And when I was looking at that, at that segment you just showed us, on the podium, it said helping people. I found that kind of Orwellian in a way. Helping people? How are we helping people by shutting down this, this pilot project, which will 
uh, help us understand whether or not such a program could truly help serve those in need in, in the future. Um, it, it didn't look smart to me, it looked dumb. And it's interesting, this government, if you look at all the podiums, all the backdrops, there are like two or three words constru mm -hmm. constructions, like for the people, mm -hmm. or uh, no carbon tax, or well, for the students recently. Constant with that, messaging. Constant, simple messaging, mm -hmm. which provides a, a visual rallying point for uh, supporters. It's in the frame as well on social media. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be shareable. There has to be a frame, there has to be a visual. Social media is visual media uh, for television and, and for newspapers. Uh, it's, it's there. So they're, they're, they're framing these very simple messages, great for the supporters, but they also provide targets for critics. And the, the messaging has to match the reality mm. of what it is that they're communicating, not just the message that they've pivoted to, but the reality of the policy outcome that will result. So when you're when your banner says helping people, but what you're actually doing is taking away the basic income from the least well-off among us. Maybe hurting people, that's maybe right. Maybe hurting people, that just doesn't jibe. No, it, it, it creates a, a clammy feel, like a dissonance, a <laughs> cognitive dissonance in a way. And I think that that doesn't sell well. And often you'll find that ministers are asked questions uh, along the lines of announcements like that. And they'll then pivot to messages that just don't make sense or well, which are contrived or, or like a, a, a predetermined, what we call in our mm -hmm. business, a key message. Let me, let me ask Linda about that because after saying that we're gonna wind down the basic income pilot, Lisa McLeod went on to say, because that is clearly not the answer for Ontario families. And I wonder if the Ontario families she's referring to there are, are the progressive conservative party base, which don't want to pay for this program, as opposed to the people who are intended to be the target of it. 100%. I mean, I definitely think that uh, they are always playing to their base uh, and sometimes struggle to re you know, recognize the rest of Ontario, even if you know, some of those people can consider themselves part of that base. I think that they struggle to put themselves in those shoes. Hmm. And so in their minds, it's like, well, this doesn't make sense for these people without ever really knowing who those people are. Okay, next announcement uh, they had a lot of fun with. Governments don't often get hmm. to make fun announcements, but this one they thought was a lot of fun. Sheldon, if you would. I'm happy to say that I do have the answer to your question. A question that people across this province have been asking, no matter where I go, they keep asking this question. Ontario, the day you've been waiting for is finally here. We're bringing back a buck of beer to Ontario. Here, here. <laughs> okay, clearly not the issue that the government will rise or fall on and the fate of the world will not depend on it. But what'd you think? I love that clip. Um, <laughs> I, I love it for a couple of reasons. One, as you mentioned, a, a lot of times people watch TV without any sound. And I love that they always do have those few words because if you saw that, you could interpret that a lot of different ways. It said right? buck a beer on the podium. Right. And you so, got the premier looking very happy and jovial and so yeah, on. Yeah. I also love that he um, started that with a question that he wanted people to think <laughs> people are really asking him for. I find it hard to believe that someone who's going to be our new premier, people are rushing around asking, are we going to have a buck of beer? Uh, so I thought that was very interesting. Again, in my mind, it goes back to in, in what they believe their base wants could be asking this question, mm -hmm. uh, although you know I would struggle to believe that. And so he really did think this was a good news story and that people were really going to be excited about this. Now, that Bob, was it, <laughs> it did, well, I was going to say, was it somewhat problematic in as much as almost no breweries jumped on this, yeah. and here we are a few months later, and it doesn't really exist anymore? Well, there's that podium sign again with those three words, buck a beer. So a very clear message, very straightforward, a mass audience can understand. And this government, I would give them a very high mark for communicating uh, complex information in a simple way mm -hmm. that lots of people could get, okay? There's no doubt what their priorities are here. Buck a beer. But you tell me, Steve, where do I go to buy this buck of beer? Every government, and this is a, there are two pillars of PR reputation. Mm -hmm. There's the uh, uh, sense of their character and of their competence. So the character, like things like ethics, for example, or priorities. Um, buck of beer, should that really be among the government's top priorities in terms of the character of the government? Are we not concerned about uh, addiction as a key part of the mental health concern in the province of Ontario today? And then you look at, at the competence of the government. 
It's one thing to announce things. It's one thing to have a wonderful press release and a, uh, an event with uh, you know, an unveiling of a new initiative, but it's quite another to actually deliver a real policy. And this is the problem with the Ford government, I think. Uh, they've been announcing different things that don't actually happen in real life. And don't forget, this is consistent with what was going on in the election campaign mm -hmm. when the government said that they were going to uh, not to part with any jobs in the public service and yes. we're going to increase program spending and at the same time clean up that liberal financial mess. Um, pie in the sky. Uh, so delivering a reality-based program, not just PR-driven rhetoric, that's the key thing for them to work on. Okay, let's move into our second bucket, if you like, of kinds of announcements. And these next ones are not announcements that they spent months planning on and waiting to roll out. These are ones where they are responding to, mm -hmm. you know what hits the fan. And I'm not sure there's been a bigger one than over who should be the head of the OPP. Sheldon, roll it, please. With this appointment, Doug Ford is promoting a close friend and ally by several ranks, leapfrogging the OPP senior leadership team without an explanation. We know that Mr. Ford did not recuse himself from Cabinet when Mr. Tavener was approved. We also know that the required qualifications for this position were lowered after the job was posted and that Mr. Tavener did not qualify for the position prior to this change in requirements. What we don't know is the role Doug Ford played in making this appointment happen or why Mr. Ford would sign off on an appointment that so clearly has the appearance of a conflict. Okay, that's Ron Tavener being referred to by Andrea Horvath, the opposition leader. Uh, Ron Tavener, longtime uh, member of the Toronto Police Service, longtime friend of uh, now Premier Ford's. And uh, the last thing I think the opposition leader said was some murkiness around the role that the Premier played in whether he did see to it or whether he was completely hands off having Mr. Tavener be appointed to that job. Uh, the opposition had a field day with this. How did the government like it? They didn't like it very much at all. I think, unfortunately, they didn't get out ahead of the story as fast as they needed to. And, you know, media, they're just going to keep peeling that onion until they get the story that they're looking for. And I think because we've seen so many other things happen and sort of fade away quickly, I think they were hoping that this one would also just sort of fade away quickly. And that did not happen. And they didn't... They, they needed to really retrench, get their story straight, have clarity about what had, you know, happened. And, you know, Doug Ford provide a very transparent accounting. Uh, and even if he felt that Rom was the best person for this job, he still had to excuse himself from the situation. And he sort of took his time getting to that point. And so that just made it seem worse. I wonder, Bob, if it was a bit of a problem, because mm. on the one hand, the Premier said, I had nothing to do with this appointment, I'd recused myself. But on the other hand, he said, it's a political appointment and I can put anybody I want in that job. You, you know, if you're giving communications advice, what has he just done? He's just spent a lot of political capital on another power play. Why did he spend so much political capital in pushing the Toronto City Council measure through? Why is he spending so much political capital on a, a mid-level officer getting the top job in the OPP in a way that may be ethically suspect, some people contend? Again, we have to look at those twin pillars of PR reputation, character and competence. Uh, what is the character of a government that would try to push through this, this personal favorite appointment and what's supposed to be kind of an atmosphere of meritocracy? Mm -hmm. And what is their competence in how they explain it and how they deliver it? This appointment has not yet happened. Uh, Mr. Tavender's taken his old job back again, mm -hmm. and so this is in the pending column. So I think that this is not a win for the Ford government, and they have some work to do in explaining this. I want to get both of your advice on this, because the reason this story is still pending is that the opposition has asked the integrity commissioner to look into this appointment and see that it's all kosher. And if it's not, the government so far hasn't said we'll accept the verdict of the integrity commissioner regardless of what he comes back with. They have said we have a lot of respect for the integrity commissioner, but that's it. Linda, if the Integrity Commissioner would come back and say there were irregularities in this process and we don't recommend that Ron Tavener be given this job, what communication strategy would you suggest to the government if they still want him in that position? I, I think they're going to have to find a way to communicate 
why he is the best person for the job uh, and also build a, a, a better base of support for this, which presumably, if they still want to go down that road, they're doing right now. Hmm. I mean, they have time. Do it now if you really want to do that. Uh, but I'm I'm not sure that he's going to care if they support it or not. They actually haven't done anything on that in the interim, right? They've sort of left this one alone. Yeah. So what would you recommend quiet. that they do if they still want Ron Taverner in that job in the event of a negative report from the integrity commissioner? Well, I, I think that's a very difficult question. Uh, there's no explaining your way out of a situation where you really are trying to parachute in your longtime friend into a position where he may not actually meet all the criteria which were initially established in what was supposed to be a standards-based competition. So there's no PR answer to, to explain this away. Hmm. I mean, and, and this is where I have a problem with the government. I've given them high marks in terms of simplifying messages, which other governments haven't been as good at. But this government will deliberately communicate misinformation to try to get what it wants. Like what? Uh, well, like the Ron Tavener appointment. Uh, saying that he had nothing to do with it, for example, or uh, talking about the uh, appointment in a way that I think is disingenuous. Well, we don't, um, we don't have empirically provable evidence that Doug Ford put his thumb on the scale for Ron Taverner. We sure, don't have that. It sure looks that way. It, it, it sure does not pass the stink test, and the optics aren't great, but there's no empirically provable evidence to suggest that he went in there, fixed the committee, and said, you've got to pick this guy. Well, there's no empirical evidence that suggests he decided to reduce the size of the Toronto City Council because he was settling old scores. But I think that's still a pretty credible point of view or concern hmm. to have about what actually happened. Hmm. Okay, let's move on to the next one. And the next one actually just took place uh, this past week and earlier this week. Um, a public servant leaked a document having to do with the plans that the Ministry of Health and the government have to reorganize uh, some of the way that the Ministry of Health does what it does Leaky documents are almost always embarrassing for governments, and this one was a true PR challenge. Uh, let's see the clip. We're going to hear from the opposition leader, we'll hear from the Minister of Health, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, please. If there was any doubt that this government is committed to massive privatization in health care, that doubt vanishes with this bill. Andrea Horvath's lack of understanding of our health care system has never been more apparent. Dating back to the 15 years of Liberal governments led by McGuinty and Wynne, the NDP have been crying wolf about the privatization of the health care system. It wasn't true then, and it isn't true now. And, and that's really what this story is all about. The NDP say they have a doc, they have many documents which mm -hmm. suggest that the government intends to privatize parts of the health care system. You've heard the health minister as well say that is not the plan at all. We're going to restructure, reorganize, but we're not planning to additionally privatize things. When a document leaks and when you have competing press conferences and it's now a thing, right? They're now vying for the hearts and minds of Ontarians to see who has more credibility. What's the communications advice in that case to the government? Well, I, I think the communications advice in this particular situation is one, you have to ensure that, to the best of your ability, that internally you have everybody on board hopefully singing from the same song sheet, which I don't think that they necessarily had. You also need to, you know, it's, it's having your own mini crisis plan in place. I mean, leaked documents happen even from the best of companies. Look at Apple. It happens to them all the time. And I think people think they're, you know, a pretty good company. I, I just feel that they, they weren't, they don't always think through what could actually happen in these situations and how are we going to manage it? So then we get into these moments where they're doing competing press conferences, people are saying things, and then the next day it's a totally different message. And we're like, but you just said that yesterday. So we don't really know. And I just feel that they keep thinking that this can't happen to them, but it does, and it continues to. The government clearly did not have a heads up that they were about to did be victimized by a, you know, by a public servant who leaked, public servant who subsequently got fired. So when that happens, and when the opposition leader says, I got something here and it's going to embarrass the heck out of you, what is the government to do? I think what they would normally do or be well advised to do is what they would do if a budget is leaked before the official announcement. They would, they would simply bring forward the time where they disclose to the public in a transparent way what they have decided to do. Now, they deployed the minister, Christine Elliott, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. She's likable, competent, and effective communicator. 
So I think she did well with her counterattack. But people are now sort of left wondering what's going to happen or how much of this is true. And so when the ultimate policy is articulated and, and then uh, tabled by the government and the legislature... Which will probably happen later this month. Mm -hmm. Later this month, mm -hmm. um, then people are going to compare what just happened now with the reality of that, that policy. And if there's any difference between the two, the government's credibility could be, could be undermined. So I think uh, they have, in this case, uh, deployed the Ontario Provincial Police in a way that maybe increases concerns about what we were just discussing. Ron Tavener and the whole concept of having a political police in Ontario. Um, it, it's a reminder that we don't want political police. At least a lot of people would say that's a bad idea for the province of Ontario. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's your main concern? Fearlessly and transparently, courageously sharing what you're going to do with the public or covering up someone who was leaking the document? Where do your priorities lie? Is there, Linda, ever an argument to be made if you're the government which goes something like this? This was a public servant who leaked this. It was an unauthorized leak. We haven't made any decision about this file yet. It's still in motion. Let's just ignore it. Is that an option? Well, uh, yes, up until the let's just ignore it. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that you can absolutely say that, um, recognizing that, you know, people are going to want to know more about this. And, and that's where the focus has now shifted, right? Everybody is going to, wanting to know, are there more leaked documents? Where are we going to see more of it? I think it's totally fair to say, you know what, we're not ready to actually discuss that. We are, you know, in mid-conversation consulting. I, you never hear the word, we are consulting with you know, X, Y, Z. We never hear that. It, it is this immediate, you know, we made this decision and this is what we're moving well, forward. Well, they did on education. On sex ed, they said, we're going to do a massive consultation with people online. Right. They did do it in those circumstances. Um, but I, I feel like they did it because they mm -hmm. felt like they, they got a lot of pushback and people were asking for that. Sure. Yeah, you know, in this case, yeah, I do think that you can say that. Um, I think people would appreciate the honesty to say, you know what, that's unfortunate, that happened. We're not ready to talk about it. But here are, you know, what we are doing. Let's take our remaining moments here, and to do that, I want to look at a tweet that you put out not too long ago. Sheldon, let's bring this up if we can, and for those listening on podcast, I'll describe this. Uh, Bob Picard put out a tweet showing on the left side, there's two pictures. On the left side is Donald Trump holding up a document that he has just clearly signed with a group of, uh, you know, stakeholders or, you know, cabinet ministers, some, something behind him, and he's sort of brandishing this document that he's just signed showing... Look what we've just done. On the right-hand side of the frame is Doug Ford with two documents looking very similar to the Trump documents in front of him. There's Christine Elliott, his deputy premier, beside him. Some other cabinet ministers in the background. And again, everybody's smiling as if to say, whatever I've just signed was important and look at what we have just achieved. Um, you tweeted here, Bob. Yeah. These pictures sure do look similar. Let's have more public relations originality at Queen's Park. What didn't you like about that? It's pure copycatism from a government that also started to deploy political staffers to press events where they would they would applaud like trained seals in a way that uh, they had picked up from what Trump was doing at his press conferences in the United States. I think there always has been in Canadian communications and, and public relations and among the political class a tendency to follow what the Americans are doing and to adapt it here to, uh, to Canada, to Ontario in this case. Now, actually, when I look at that picture, I also notice the absence of people of color in the, uh, in the, in the Ford picture. Um, it's not just what they share in common. It's, Sheldon, it's, want to put it back up? Yeah, there we go. That's an important difference. But it's the diversity. Um, I think that's also mm -hmm. missing from the, the Tory side of that, of that, that image. I, I would also just want to take this opportunity. It's a social media share. Look at an area where they are not following Trump. It's Twitter. It's the leadership communication. Mm -hmm. Of, of the top person. Now, my business partner, Nick Nanos, who has been on this program yep. before, he did a poll, and he found out that 61% of Canadians want the, the leader, uh, the CEO, to communicate something, uh, their point of view, uh, their emotions of the moment, um, facts of what's happening, if, especially if there's a crisis going on. Now, what we see is that uh, Trump will comment on Twitter in the US about just about everything that's happening, almost a real-time communication, and you know it's him. Or it looks like it's well, him almost all the time. Much of it's crazy in a two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's so, how you know it's him. Well, there's this authenticity benefit that he gets. <laughs> there it's is a PR that. benefit. Yeah. 
But I don't think the same thing happens with Ford. Ford had about 5,000 Twitter followers when he declared his intention to seek the leadership. Now he's got 117,000. But it doesn't look like he himself is doing the social media sharing. Mm -hmm. So the authenticity of Doug Ford, he, he's not sort of signaling his leadership on social media in the same personal way with that, that, that touch of his, his, his personality that Trump is doing in the South. Linda, I got a minute left for you to tell me whether, I mean, it, it's pretty clear that Doug Ford is using some of the same PR techniques to create a visual image as Donald Trump did. Bob didn't like it that much. What do you think? Uh, I think he, I think he posted what he thought people expected to see from the government. In his mind, he has a vision of what that looks like, and that's what it looks like. And and I think that all of his communication is framed around what, in his mind, you know, how we run the government should look like. And all communication starts with him, and then goes out. A tiny little bit. Do you want to see uh, the Premier of Ontario tweeting his most deep thoughts at two o'clock in the morning? I, I think it I actually think it would be somewhat interesting. Uh, to Bob's point, I, I do think then you might actually see who he is as an authentic person, and and we don't get to see that. So sometimes I think we respond to the communications because we're not really sure what's behind it. <laughs> Watch out what you wish for. I know. That's Linda Andros. She's the managing partner of Apex Public Relations. Bob Picard, the principal at Signal Leadership Communications. I want to thank both of you for coming in tonight and uh, putting the Ford government through its paces in terms of public relations and communication skills. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.